Well, good evening and, and welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us. My name is Richard Harris and I am Associate Director of the Institute for Community Studies and a trustee of Caritas Social Action Network. And, and I'm delighted so many of you have been able to join us at this, the third in our series of four conversations about the common good. Just a few housekeeping points. This is a Zoom webinar rather than a normal Zoom meeting. So we can't actually see you, but you can see and hear us. So feel free to follow the discussion this evening while eating your dinner, doing the washing up or lying on the sofa. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you're most welcome. And please use the chat. It would be great to find out who else is here. So do introduce yourselves, where you're from, your name, organization and so on, and share your thoughts with us and with each other as the discussion progresses throughout the evening. But of course, please keep your comments friendly and civil. Finally, we'd love to put your questions to our panel. So please use the Q&A function. I'll keep an eye on it as the evening progresses and I'll select some of the best questions for the panel to respond to later on. It's always helpful if you can add your name and organization when asking a question, but it's fine to ask questions anonymously if you prefer. And don't forget, you can also upvote questions asked by others if someone else has asked a great question that you'd like the panel to address. Okay, we've got the housekeeping out of the way, so let's get going. Welcome to the common good. What does it mean for families, for civil society, and for government? A series of four conversations taking place between June and November. As our country faces complex challenges ahead, we've assembled a really first-rate group of speakers to help us explore the meaning and importance of the common good and the responsibility it places on families, society, and the state. This series of four conversations is brought to you by a coalition of organizations, Together for the Common Good, the Center for Social Justice, Caritas Social Action Network, and the Benedict XVI Center for Religion and Society at St. Mary's University. And we're delighted that this series is supported by CCLA, one of the UK's largest ethical fund managers, home of the new Catholic Investment Fund. As I said earlier, I'm Richard Harris, and I'm delighted to be chairing the conversation this evening on behalf of the coalition partners. And our conversation is the third in the series, and it's going to look at the common good. What does it mean for society? First of all, what is the common good? Well, in our first discussion back in June, and if you weren't able to make it, I urge you to watch it on the St. Mary's YouTube account, we discovered that in its true sense, the common good relates to the shared life of society. We learned that it is not a utopian ideal, but a settled pluralism of identities and interests. We saw how relationship building is at the heart of the common good, along with balancing the power between market, state and civil society. We saw how at a time of great uncertainty and with complex challenges ahead, the common good calls us all into a vision of civil, civic renewal. Importantly, we saw that the responsibility for the common good does not fall solely upon the state. In fact, it also depends on each individual, family and civil society organization working together in harmony, each taking responsibility at the appropriate level. Then in our second webinar in July, we looked at the role of the family as the fundamental foundation upon which the common good is built and how it's been undermined in recent years, not only culturally and ideologically, but also weakened by economic and fiscal policies that prioritize the individual. In our final session in November, we're going to look at what the common good means for government, but tonight we're going to examine the crucial role of civil society institutions, especially locally and regionally, who have a key responsibility in building the common good. And by civil society, we're talking about that rich web of associations, businesses, clubs, unions, schools, colleges, churches, mosques and temples, charities, social enterprises, and countless other local institutions that together make up the pattern of our daily lives. At their best, each plays a vital part in promoting the common good, enabling people to find fulfillment together. Their absence or weakness can seriously affect a community's ability to thrive. And at their worst, of course, they can sow division 
and split communities apart. Each has a role, indeed a vocational responsibility, to contribute to fraternity and the spiritual and social capital necessary for a healthy society. And our conversation this evening will assess the capacity of these institutions in 21st century Britain, their strengths and weaknesses to fulfill their distinctive responsibilities as we work towards civic renewal. We'll consider what steps can be taken and how public policy can best support civil society to fulfill its vital role. And now I'm delighted to introduce our panel this evening. Uh, David Goodhart, author, journalist, head of demography unit at the Policy Exchange Think Tank and a commissioner at the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Trevor Phillips, OBE, writer, broadcaster, chairman of the Green Park Group, co-founder of the data analytics firm Weber Phillips and chairman of Index on Censorship. And Dame Julia Unwin, consultant, speaker and writer, former chief executive of the Joseph Rantry Association, uh, Joseph Rantry Foundation, I beg your pardon, and chair of the Civil Society Futures Inquiry, which reported in 2018. We had hoped we'd also be joined tonight by Tim Montgomery, uh, the founder of uh, Conservative Home and uh, co-founder of the Centre for Social Justice. Unfortunately, Tim's unwell and can't join us, but he might join us later, we'll, we'll see, but we're going to have to go ahead without him. But welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. The way this is going to work is that we're first going to hear from our presenters about five minutes each before digging into a conversation together for around half an hour. And then it's your chance in the audience to have your questions answered by the panel. So as I said earlier, please do put those questions into the Q&A box if there's something you really want the panel to address. And so now we'll briefly hear from each of David, Julia and Trevor before opening up the discussion. David, you're going to kick us off this evening, so over to you. Well, hello, everybody. Um, we're discussing some, some quite big and rather fuzzy concepts in some ways. And it actually struck me um, just in the last couple of days that the common good is quite hard to describe positively, but we certainly know uh, its opposite. <laughs> there couldn't be a better definition of its opposite, I think, than panic buying, um, the kind of panic buying we've seen in the last few days. Uh, civil society is one of those concepts that has that kind of rather rather kind of wholesome and sort of benign aura about it. Um, but of course, you know, if by civil society we mean pretty well everything that isn't the private realm or the state, then it's kind of where everything goes wrong as well. Um, and indeed, I mean, the, the, um, I mean, the thing that I've been banging on about uh, in the last few years is the, the over-domination of just one, one um, cluster of ideas, one, one worldview, um, the over-domination of the secular, liberal, kind of graduate worldview, uh, what, I, what I have called the anywhere worldview, uh, a worldview that tends to stress or be comfortable with mobility, with openness, with novelty, uh, with, with autonomy. Um, and, uh, you know, I think civil society tends to be dominated by, uh, by this worldview. Um, uh, in, certainly in the kind of the institutions you think of the sort of bigger national type institutions in the media um, in um, cultural institutions NGOs schools and universities even even businesses big businesses particularly perhaps less so in in small community organizations um, um, and, and, and I think this is not such good news for, for the common good, the fact that, uh, that, that, that the anywhere worldview has been so dominant um, in civil society. Um, but I think it does help to explain one of the, the peculiarities of contemporary politics, which is that um, the left, or, or at least what one might loosely call kind of modern liberalism, tends to dominate the public conversation. It tends to dominate civil society, uh, and yet, uh, certainly in this country and, and in many similar countries, the right tends to win elections. Um, and um, um, there's actually quite there's an interesting book by the conservative American 
journalist Christopher Caldwell um, called, I think it's called the Age of Entitlement. Um, but he 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 calls this the, the the two constitutions that the first constitution in modern liberal democracies is the sort of the, the basics of democracy. It's you know elections, electing everybody from from the president to the rat catcher. Um, it's political parties, you know, it, it, it's, it's the sort of the foundations of, of, um, of, of modern democracy. It's, it's the rule of law, um, uh, rights, etc. cetera. Um, but then you've got the second constitution, which, is, um, which tends to be based much more around the law uh, and around, um, around, around civil society organizations. Um, and um, uh, and you know more and more of the sort of public discourse tends to be dominated by the second constitution. Um, and I think one of the dangers in our societies is that is that the two constitutions, um, that, I mean, they both have their kind of their legitimate realm of kind of authority and power, um, but that they're they they're, they're in danger of becoming too far apart. Um, and uh, you know, real democratic legitimacy comes primarily from the first constitution. Um, the second constitution is sort of um, borrows its legitimacy in many ways from the from the first constitution. Um, but and I, and I think um, I think you know a, a healthy civil society um, requires that that gap not to grow too large. Um, and I, I actually heard Caldwell talking about this with. Um, with Andrew Sullivan, um, the, the, the former British journalist who now works mainly in America. Um, he's the man probably more responsible for, um, for, for gay marriage in America than, than anyone else. He wrote a famous book about it back in the mid nineties. Um, and um, I, they, they had a really interesting conversation on Andrew Sullivan's podcast. And Sullivan was, was who's, who's, who's also a conservative, but a much more liberal conservative than Caldwell was kind of was pushing back against Caldwell. But it, but it was very interesting to hear. He was then sort of thinking aloud, was saying, well, actually, you know, we won gay marriage in America essentially through the second constitution, not through the first constitution. Um, and actually that is that was that 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 was something to regret in some ways. He was now saying he thought you know it would have taken a bit longer to win it through the first constitution, through a kind of you know, democratic debate, you know, through one or even both main parties having it in their uh, election manifestos. Um, but they didn't. Um, it, it was essentially it, it was a, le a legal decision was taken uh, in America. Now America is obviously rather different to us, and the, the law plays a different role. Um, but I think um, you know part of the point of a healthy civil society, I think. In, in contemporary politics would be pushing back against even kind of repairing, you, one might say, some of the failures of modern liberalism, you know, that, by which I mean, you know, that you know, liberalism is, isn't very good at belonging. Um, I think it's, it, it's too comfortable um, with rapid change. Um, it tends to favour um, you know, cognitive capabilities over over other kinds of capabilities. It tends not to be interested in the in the private realm of the family, and so on and so on. Uh, yeah, everyone would have a perhaps a slightly different list. Um, but I think um, I think that is that you know part of what civil society should be doing is pushing back against that um, or the, the 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 kind of failures of that dominant liberalism. But but it isn't. I mean, it, you know, too much of the time, I think. Particularly in the national organisation, it merely reflects it, um, gives it voice. Um, so, um, just one other. Um, I, I think I'll probably, I probably I've had my five minutes, but just one other. Um, and it, you know, if we're, if we're thinking about um, promoting the common good um, in civil society, one slightly tangential thought to, to what I've just been saying is is it has clearly got to be volunteering. I mean, I think one of one of the good things has, that has come out of the pandemic. Um, is it is it again? It has showed the great, the great capacity, the great desire to volunteer of many people in this society, and it's always. I mean, I, you know, the, and the, the internet ought to make it sort of so much easier than it is. Um, and I think we've had sort of two, two sort of almost conflicting um, developments in in volunteering. I mean, on the one hand, 
the internet and, and the, you know, the, the much greater ease of communication uh, with through, through, through social media and so on uh, has, has made it easier to, to volunteer either formally or informally, you know, we'll think of all the kind of WhatsApp groups that popped up to, to help um, elderly neighbours, as say, during the pandemic. On the other hand, we have all of the um, uh, anxiety about child protection and so on, which means that um, volunteering is often made made harder. You know, there are kind of more hoops you have to jump through in order to be legitimated as a as a volunteer. But I mean, I I I, I do think that uh, it ought to be. Um, you know, it's it's something that that we we should think about is making, uh, you know, as it were, capitalizing on what we saw during the. Um, during the pandemic and, and one place in particular I think that would be valuable I've just uh, read Madeline Bunting's very good book on care and her descriptions of visiting lots of care homes this was before the the crisis lots of care homes and just you know the, the, the staff are so busy just you know looking after doing the basics that there there aren't people to to talk to elderly people who you know who become very lonely even in even when they're in a, a residential home and I think a lot of people would be would be happy to volunteer to, and, and of course they do. Um, I mean, this, this does go on, but um, I mean, uh, that, that's the kind of thing that I think could benefit from a much higher sort of national profile um, in the volunteering um, sphere. David, um, let me stop there. Thank you very much, David. What an excellent start to the conversation. You've, you've laid down some really important points for us to cover in, in the conversation further on. Julia, can I ask you to, to make some opening remarks? Thank you. It's not the first time David said things that made me think very hard, and some of it I agreed with and some of it I didn't agree with. Um, but thank you for setting up this very important discussion. I think civil society is absolutely central to the common good. But picking up David's point, there will always and everywhere be a tension between what I think is participatory democracy, how we come together to make change happen, and representative democracy, which is Calderwood's first structure. I would say, of course, that Ireland voted for gay marriage through a referendum, so we've done it differently in different places. But I would argue it's essential because civil society is about belonging if it's about anything. It's about, fundamentally, our desire for associational life. The fact that people are in choirs or allotment societies, churches, gurdwaras, wherever they feel they belong, is the baseline of civil society. And certainly when I was leading the inquiry a few years ago, pre-pandemic, so I have to reference that, a very big issue emerged time and time again, of people saying the only place I feel I belong is this group, this organisation, my place of work, which was for most men for decades and decades, their primary sense of belonging is no longer that because the world of work has changed. So associational life being fantastically important for the common good. We know from all the research, it's good for our well-being, it's good for the places we live, we need have a desperate human need to belong. Linked with that, we need voices and advocates and a sense of what we can do differently. Surviving through this hideous pandemic, which in many ways I don't think we've yet calibrated how difficult it's been, where would we be without the groups of people who are patients with a very particular condition making their voices heard at their hospitals through their GPs up to the Department of Health? Where would we be if we didn't have that level of advocacy about what needs to change, what's being ignored, what's overlooked? A fantastic achievement. Everybody in getting homeless people off the streets would not have happened if there weren't those loud voices saying global pandemic, rough sleepers are in a very dangerous place indeed. So my second thing I think it brings to the common good is voice and agency. And then the third is, of course, the mutual aid, which was so celebrated at the start of the pandemic. But is there in every community up and down the country, the state depends on all of us playing our part? we've got into this fiction in the UK that somehow civil society depends on the state. Where would the police be if they didn't have local community organisations pointing to where there are guns and knives and gangs getting going? Where would any local authority be if it didn't have that antennae and that local intelligence out there? So the mutual aid which came as a crisis response, not just in Covid, but in the floods in South Yorkshire the same year, in every disaster you can think about, that explosion of mutual aid is at the heart of civil society. Now, I think this is all essential to the state, all three of those things. The state will very often behave as if somehow it supports civil society. 
that civil society is the bedrock on which the state operates. But it doesn't happen by accident. There are preconditions that make those sorts of strong, resilient neighbourhood and community effects happen. And there are things that degrade and make it difficult. And frankly, at the moment, absolute exhaustion and a feeling of being lent on too much is one of the things that people tell me. But it's also other preconditions about people's real sense of insecurity and precariousness makes it very hard for them to have that sense of belonging that we know is essential for our well-being. I think there are challenges to the behaviours, attitudes and practices in civil society. I think there are bits of civil society that became far too detached from the bread and butter of civil society. I think what's changed in the last year is a really serious reconnection, a new approach to accountability, which is not just to governor, government or regulators or funders, but it is to the people we exist to serve. And I think that the reach of civil society is going to be one of the things that will get us through this extraordinarily precarious decade that we are now launching into. Thank you. Julia, thank you very much indeed. Um, again, uh, really helpful uh, start to the conversation and it'll be interesting uh, when we get to the, to the main conversation pitching what you've said with, with, with David's uh, comments at the start but Trevor over to you now. Uh, thank you very much Richard I hope I'm uh, I, I can be heard. Um, I think there are three terms that we are going to be knocking about in this conversation. First of all civil society, second good and third, common. And um, when I'm thinking about what I might say here, I kept running into what I think is quite a profound problem for me, which is that in our country today, it is not at all clear to me that what we think of as civil society uh, is uh, the is tending towards the common and the good. Uh, let me start by explaining it this way. Last, last Friday, I went to um, a memorial for a very dear friend who was um, a preacher, and he led um, a black church and then a uh, co collection of black churches um, over actually several decades now. There's no issue at all. Uh, we know all the history of why black churches came into being and so on. But I think the truth of the matter is that um, though it is not the church at which I worship, it is certainly the church in which I feel more comfortable and it reflects the church in which I was brought up. That is to say, when we talk about civil society, we are talking about a myriad of institutions, collections of people, um, not necessarily even based in a building, but a network, a network of infinite variety, pretty much. But within that infinite variety, actually, there are uh, nodes to which um, in the technical language, I run um, some technical, uh, I have some technical companies. Uh, there are nodes to which we will adhere where we feel more comfortable than others. That I think instantly presents quite an issue because come on to my second term, the point, uh, the word good, we cannot assume that each of those nodes to which we attach ourselves will have the same idea of what good looks like in any given situation. Um, and I, David has just joined the Equality and Human Rights Commission. When we set up the commission, probably the first and biggest difficulty that I think I encountered intellectually and actually practically as well, and I'll come, to, come on to exactly why it became so hard, um, was working out the difference between equality and diversity. There was a sort of idea that everybody who's committed to equality would eventually head in the same direction, that we would all uh, realize that actually, as the saying goes now, we have more in common than divides us. It is probably true that 
most human beings have more in common than uh, divides us. We all like to breathe air. We all would prefer our children to grow healthily than not healthily. We all would prefer not to be at war and so on. That may be true that on 95% of things, we absolutely agree. The problem is that there may be a remaining 5% which are not necessarily, which are where we are irreconcilable. Um, and the problem is that that 5% can't simply be buried by people saying, well, it's a small thing at the edge, because it may be the most important thing in the world for us. I'm going to take a small digression. When I started, um, as I said, at the EHRC, one of the first conversations I had was about uh, gender. Um, and I asked the predecessor body, the Equality, um, Equal Opportunities Commission, what should, be our, what should our objective be for leadership in companies? Should we want 50-50 or do we want something else? And of course, every, and at that time, everybody said, naturally, yes, we want 50-50. And I asked why. And the answer was because actually there should be no difference between men and women. Problem is that that's true if you look at things in a particular way. But over here, the commission was also making the argument that women have a different distribution of skills and capabilities, part because of experience and so on. I'm not making a recourse to biology here. Um, women understand certain kinds of discri discrimination and oppression in a way that men cannot and so on. That actually women bring something different to the party and that therefore actually what mattered was diversity across the piece. Well, why does this present a problem? Well, it presents a problem, and I, um, I'm chairman of a recruitment company, and it's a very practical problem. It is true that different groups of people bring different kinds of capabilities based on who they are, their experience, and what, they, what, uh, what they've learned about life to any given task. And that means that in some circumstances, you don't want 50-50, or that isn't the natural way in which it settles. My... Um, I have a relative who runs uh, a company, television production company. Uh, it is owned by her and another woman. Every time they add a third partner who is a man, they tank. They always work better among, with uh, a group of women. Now, I don't think that's going to be the case everywhere, but it is the case for them. And it's true elsewhere. So the point I'm really trying to make here is that when we think about uh, the civil society and we think about good and common, I think we first have to make a decision about what we mean by all of those things or what those things mean in the real world. Now, it happens that in our particular, um, in the recruitment company where I am chair, we tend to, we recruit slightly more, we put more women in board and executive seats than we do men. Um, and we also put about a third of our appointments, and we make hundreds every year, uh, who are ethnic minorities. We're quite good at it. But we are always trying to fit people to a particular place. And the, the point I really want to make here, which is to come back to something that Richard said right at the very beginning, reflecting on previous sessions, when you talked about settled pluralism, we have to make a decision when we're talking about the common good what does that mean when we can't necessarily agree on what good looks like? And I just want to come towards the end of my few minutes um, to talk a little bit about perhaps a, the most difficult decision I ever had to make in um, public office. I don't think it's any particular secret that I'm a person brought up in, in the Christian faith and I'm an adherent. The most difficult decision I had to make was whether we would essentially close down um, adoption agencies, which existed within the Christian tradition, and because of that, believed that they could not uh, treat um, same-sex couples in the same way as they might treat heterosexual couples. Without going into the detail of it, uh, it seemed to me that we really had to make a clear choice. It is not that I didn't believe that people... Uh, who ran those agencies were good people or sincere people. Uh, I did and do, but I strongly understood or strongly believed 
that their idea of what good looked like was at odds with uh, the definition, if I can put it that way, that got, that Parliament gave me uh, and that uh, adheres in the majority of our society. Um, that was a very difficult thing, but it is when we start to talk about the common good, these are the kind of choices that we're going to have to make. That is uh, accelerated uh, these days, particularly by globalization. Uh, those who live in London and its environs and its suburb, by which I mean Oxford, Cambridge, Brighton, and so on, benefit hugely from globalization. David's written very eloquently and effectively about this. There are people who live in other places uh, who do not benefit from it and who want a different kind of good life. How do we manage both of those things together? Um, and I suppose uh, the last thing I would say is very simply that civil society has a great role to play in trying to help us understand where uh, the idea of good can make, be made to overlap, but also I think it has a responsibility in helping us negotiate and decide where sincerely held beliefs do not uh, allow us to settle on a single idea for the society as a whole of what the common good looks like. Thank you. Trevor, thank you very much indeed. And, and thank you again to all, all three panelists for, for really powerful uh, opening uh, comments. Uh, it falls to me now to try and stim turn this into a, into a conversation. And I've got to say, actually, as, as, um, as you were talking, Trevor, I, I was about particularly the definition of good and, and what we mean by that and whether there's a, uh, an agreement on that. I, I was reminded of um, Michael Young. I mentioned right at the top that I, I'm an associate director at the Institute for Community Studies, which Michael Young set up in 1953. This amazing individual who in his lifetime, you know, drafted the 1945 Labour Party manifesto, um, uh, created the Open University, created the Consumer Association, which, um, and also, by the by, defined the term meritocracy. Uh, you know, he was the first person to do it. He created the word. And he, he, did, he did so in terms of a dystopian short story, which showed how society had completely collapsed because it had become completely meritocratic. And there were some at the top and some at the bottom, and the ones at the bottom revolted against it. It, it was a fascinating insight because, of course, we all take it as read that meritocracy is just what we all want on the left and on the right. Uh, and yet the, the person who coined the term did so in terms of questioning its, its, its very usefulness. And Trevor, it seemed to me that as you were talking, you, you were making the same point. Uh, I, I started this evening um, on the assumption that we all want the common good, that we're all striving towards the common good. And I think you were, you were challenging that and, and making the very powerful point that it's not the 95% of things that we agree on that, that matter, it's 5% that we disagree on. And I suppose, what I want to do at this point is perhaps, Julia, can I bring you back in? Because you made the point in your opening comments about the difference between uh, participatory democracy and representative democracy and whether that holds a key to bringing some sort of coherence to agreement about what, what good looks like that, that could be agreed upon. Well, I'll have a go, but I'm not aiming for coherence because we're talking about an incredibly messy world here. There is a cleanliness about representative democracy. You vote, you get somebody, you might argue about the process of voting, but that's what you do. The point of civil society is that that's where difficult conversations can happen. That's where difference is articulated. A lot of civil society is concerned about things that historically were minority issues that might be significant issues now. But if you think of the explosion of charities supporting people with mental health problems, um, who had been ignored and traduced and treated as if they were completely other, have had the effect of changing policy, but they fight like cats together because there are different perspectives about what constitutes good. I was talking about the local, in every local area will find people organising to protect a green open space, to build more housing. That is civil society. It is messy. It is contested. And it isn't a shared sense of a common good is an agenda. For me, a common good is that we're a society where we can have those very difficult, challenging conversations. I think social media and the internet is making that extraordinarily difficult. And I think the jury is out about whether we're in a transitional phase, which I dearly hope, and that the benefits of the digital revolution will come to pass. But I mean, clearly they are in so many other ways. But currently what's happening in social media is making it incredibly hard to have those 
complex, difficult conversations where we listen really hard and understand and maybe don't agree ever. I don't think there's any problem about civil society in which there are extraordinarily different views. You know, we can talk about the people who are concerned about protecting animals and the people who want to promote medical experiments or whatever division we want. Those battles have to be had. They have to be had civilly. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is I remember when I launched Civil Society Futures Inquiry, a journalist saying, yeah, but it's not very civil. I've always said, of course it's not civil. Civil society is born out of a desire either to protect or to change. It's not born because people haven't got anything to do on a Wednesday night and they have nothing to watch on Netflix. They go out of their homes and they sit in grotty community centres to battle things out because they care and because it's difficult and because there's challenge involved. Civil society will always be messy. And I think the common good will be messy if we define it as an objective, as a um, heavenly state which we will achieve one day. I think the common good is about the ability to have those really difficult conversations and drive social change in ways that will always be contested and always be difficult and will feel differently to different people at different times. Thank you, Julia. Uh uh, before I go on, j just to thank uh, Charles Wookie and Jim Robinson for posting questions in the Q&A box. I would encourage other members of the audience, please, to, to continue. We've got two excellent questions for later on, but, but please do add your questions. David, can I, can I bring you in at this point? Um, you talked powerfully about the two constitutions. Of course, you're, you know, also, as, as Trevor mentioned, you know, you, you, you know, your, your analysis of, of somewhere and anywhere, uh, I think, is really powerful here. Um, how do you reconcile that with the messiness that, that Julia and, and Trevor were talking about? And, and just to, to put it to put a bit of specificity on it, you talked about volunteering, and I think you know contrasted the amazing sort of flowering of mutual aid that we saw during the pandemic, which I think contrasts really interestingly with the the, the, the kind of the national program, the Good Sam program, where seven hundred fifty thousand people signed up. And for a long while, until the vaccination programme came along, really didn't have very much to do. It was quite interesting that it was only when they were aligned with this very large national body, the NHS, that actually it was, it was possible to, to, to deliver something. And, that, but, and yet the, the glorious messiness of lots of mutual aid groups seemed to achieve quite a lot. So uh, does, does the analysis of the two constitutions apply in the sort of messy environment we find ourselves in? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think it's it's part of the mess. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it's part of the mess that, well, that, that both Trevor and Julia have talked about. Um, it's about, you know, I mean, so many of our modern arguments are about conflicts of rights, aren't they? Um, um, the, um, I mean, you know, the conflict, you know, in, in the trans debate, um, you know, between the interests of trans people and the interests of, of women who want to preserve women, women only institutions for people they regard as as women, um, uh, it's a, you know it's a classic conflict of rights, um, and we see those all over the place. I mean, and and you know as 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 Trevor pointed out, I mean you know the whole point of a liberal society is that we don't have common goals, um, we don't we have very different versions and visions of the of the good society and that politics is partly about managing um, conflicts of interest, um, managing differences of interest, but also actual conflicts of interest, um, finding the modus vivendi. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I suppose that in a sense is the kind of, you know, it's a sort of common good version of politics versus a modus vivendi version of politics. And I, and I suspect, you know, we kind of sign up to both of them in a way. It's, it's how they sort of, coexist together um but i mean I, I was just thinking in relation to not so much to volunteering but oh, you know if there is a single institution that we um that we identify with the common good in this country it's probably the national health service um and yet i often do wonder whether the you know the sort of sacralization almost of the nhs you know the way that we talk about it as the national religion the way that we that we talk about the people who work in it being being angels and saints it is actually really rather bad for the institution. I mean, because on the other hand, we have, you know, quite extraordinary differences in outcomes, you know, not just between hospitals, but sort of within hospitals, um, you know, and it, it is actually staffed by fallible human beings. Um, you know, and there are there are nurses and doctors who are very good nurses and doctors. There are nurses and doctors 
who are really quite average. And there are some who are probably not really very good at all. Um, <laughs> but the way that we talk about it um, makes it very difficult to make these kinds of distinctions, which we probably need to make in order for the, uh, the organization to work better. So again, I mean, you know, if, if that is the sort of the closest we get to an institution that embodies the common good, then, um, you know, the, the common good uh, is, you know, is, is, uh, is not a simple, uh, uh, is not a simple idea. Thank you, David. And I, I'm conscious that in a sense that the conversation has moved uh, towards, uh, you know, um, how we manage some of this conflict. But I, I, was, I was quite interested in, in what the views of the panel might be about uh, specific contribution organisations can make to strengthen society and not just, um, uh, you know, uh, traditional uh, sort of charities and, and, and community groups, but also, for example, the role of, of local businesses or investors, you know, that, that rich tapestry of, of organisations I, I sort of mentioned in my opening remarks, where's the potential there for, for, um, for, for creative solutions? I think we make a mistake if we think any one sector has got a monopoly on creative solutions. I mean, they are all over the place. I think what the reason I would promote civil society as important is it provides a vehicle for ideas to be tested and developed and shared wherever they come from. So, you know, interestingly, some universities in the UK are now seeing their role as civic institutions institutions in the way that many of them pretended they weren't for a long time and they were just global and they weren't particularly interested where they were. You can't find a university now that doesn't want to talk about its role in place and in the local economy and in making those networks. Now that's because there's an ebb and flow in this. There is history and time and things will be different at different stages. So I think all sorts of organisations have a role to play in it. The reason I come back to civil society is I think it's a way of brigading a lot of very different activities. And of course, like the business world, there's lots that's very different within it. But then yeah. so there is within what we would currently call the market. There are huge differences there. Um, and I think that we have got to get much braver about recognising that 21st century requires very different sorts of networks and organizations and connections. And they probably won't all look like the ones that were spawned out of the Industrial Revolution, but we'll have different sorts of groupings emerging out of our current troubles. Thank you, Julia. And, and, and you'll know well that, you know, uh, in, in my last role, I worked with an organization that supported what we call community businesses. And this is where local people get together and decide, look, the, the pub has closed down, the shop has closed down, they've closed down the library or the leisure centre. We're going to take it over, we're going to run it ourselves, and we're going to try and do it commercially. Um, obviously, that's quite difficult, because if the private sector or the public sector haven't been able to do it themselves, you know, why should communities be able to do it? And yet, more often than not, they are able to do it. And what's fascinating for me about that is that, unlike a lot of the talk that often uh, surrounds civil society about empowerment, this is not about empowerment. This is about people taking power and, and, and creating their own sort of sense of agency. And we can, we can make our own place better. Thank you very much. You know, and we'll work with you, local authority or whoever it might be, if you can help us. But, but we're going to do it on our terms. And of course, you know, related to that, the, um, the British, British Academy has been doing a fascinating uh, study recently on the role of the corporation and how that might change. Is there something there? Is there is there a new a new uh, a hybrid approach to enterprise that that brings together that you know we talked about the state, civil society, and the market, but actually is there is there more of a blurring there that that could be exploited? Trevor, is that something you've seen? It could be exploited in both senses of the word. I think is what we need to bear in mind. Well, indeed, two meanings there. But I'll leave it to Trevor. Trevor, you're on, you're on mute. Yeah, I understand where you're, you're going with it. Can, can I just say one quick thing about the discussion you've just been having? Uh, I, I didn't, um, I probably expressed myself rather poorly. I don't think it's messy at all, actually. I think the, the, the point I was really making was that uh, actually it's quite the reverse. The problem that we have sometimes is where the choices are clear. And we genuinely, we can't navigate, we can't negotiate it, we have to choose. So for example, if I um, have to, in my businesses, work with one group or another, 
there will be groups who genuinely believe, for example, let's say, for example, I know they genuinely believe that um, you can't sell something to, or that, that women should not play this part or that part. I'm not going to work with them. It's, it's, not, it's not a complicated thing. I'm just not going to do it because I think it's wrong. It doesn't, but that doesn't mean I disrespect them. I think that they are wrong. I can understand why they might think that, but I think something completely different. And my, the issue I'm really, I was poking away at was not that it's difficult. It's, it isn't difficult at all. You have to make it, and, but, it, but when you start to talk about common good, that's often what the, the real problem is. You might agree on 99% of everything, but that last 1% in itself is the, what we would call the stopper. But uh, coming back to your, your specific question, I think that's a rather interesting thing here. I mean, um, one of the, uh, the arguments that has been going on in, in government and in, in politics for probably the last four years is uh, to what extent should um, do different kinds of enterprises serve a public purpose and therefore should be in public hands and to what extent should we put things in private hands? I mean, I've worked on both sides of that particular fence and I've got a rather simplistic view about this. Um, the, the public sector is uh, all about purposes that where everybody has to be served equally. The NHS is spectacularly the advantage, uh, the example, but the same is true about transport. Obviously, it's the same is about education. And that therefore, you cannot do what you do in the private sector, which, which is select your clients and you serve them. You don't serve anybody else. You serve your clients or your customers. So when I was at John Lewis, we were not, bluntly speaking, that interested in people who have to count the cost of their bar basket as they go round the aisles. We were interested in a very different group of people and we served the hell out of them. Aldi and Little do something slightly different. Um, so these are two quite different things. Now, I think civil society probably has to do something, a third thing. And what is interesting about what civil society does is that sometimes it mops up a space in between. But more importantly, I think what it what 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 we call civil society is um, is that set of institutions and networks that allows us to provide products, services, support um, where it's not driven by a transactional relationship, nor is it necessarily universal. Actually, there is some that there's a Whole different purpose for what we call civil society. Um, and I'm not in touch, you know, I, I don't think we've got a very, uh, you know, since the 19th century in this country, we haven't had a really very strong philosophy about how civil society works. In the United States, they do very clearly. It is, uh, and I, I'm going to stop talking in a second, but um, I think that, that you've raised a really important point. They're very clear that when they think about civil society, it is really about neighborhoods and communities. I think one of the things very interesting that's happened here, red wall constituencies and politics uh, are a kind of marker of this. And Sebastian Payne, the FT journalist has written a really interesting book about this. There are 50 or 60 constituencies which were all based on a single industry, indeed, sometimes on a single company. Steel, coal, my, uh, yeah, fun, fishing, maybe one or two kinds of manufacturing. All of those have gone away for one reason or another. They've, you know, they've gone to some other country or we don't use the product anymore, whatever it is. What is really interesting about those places, and we're thinking northeast, there's some in the south as well, by the way. Um, what has happened is the set of civil society institutions that underpinned those communities have died. Mm. So, for example, 
a man, and these are mainly male driven, by the way, another issue. Uh, the man, a man could be a miner underground six days a week or four days a week, actually. Uh, no different to anybody else. But on Saturday night, he's secretary of the miners' welfare. Whole different status. It's a civil society thing, but actually it's his identity. And by the way, his family's identity, because everybody else knows he's that guy. Uh, I learned this with African-American communities in the United States, where somebody is a janitor completely ignored five days a week by the people who go past his cubicle. On, su on Sunday morning, he's a chief steward at his, chief usher at his church, and he's the man. Now, I think we have to think really about the way in which technological change and globalization have taken that away. I, I think that the, the point about civil society is that we don't fully understand what it looks like in the 21st century anymore. I'll shut up now, sorry. No, thank you, Trevor. That, that's a really powerful point. And, and it echoes, of course, Robert Putnam's analysis, you know, bowling alone. Um, and, and by the way, his, his recent uh, uh, book, um, uh, on the I we debate is also is also very good. David, do do, do you agree with uh, Trevor's analysis there? Does that does that resonate with you? Uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah, and, and this is something that that has has been happening for forty or fifty years. Um, I mean, it happened very very rapidly in parts of the North and the Midlands, particularly was the destruction of a whole way of life. I mean, you know, often within sort of ten or fifteen years, and I think. You know, you might say that the Conservative Party, who were partly responsible for, I mean, a, a lot of these industries were, were had to had to shrink. Um, indeed, they were shrinking already in the, you know, when Harold Wilson was Prime Minister. Um, but um, is is the kind of speed with which it happened uh, in this country that that you know that that Margaret Thatcher got the blame for, rightly or wrongly, um, and the you know the comparison between industrial Yorkshire and Lancashire and the Ruhr Gebiet in Germany, I think is an instructive one. Um, uh, uh, you know, German politics didn't, would not have allowed um, the, the, the rate of change. And I do think, you know, this is one of the sort of pathologies of modern liberalism. The fact that that was considered sort of normal. I mean, the destruction of, of ways of life and sources of meaning for so many people. Um, you know, you, you might say that is the sort of, um, you know, if, if there is a, you know the, the sort of the right wing version of over rapid change is the, is the creative destruction of modern capitalism, which which can wipe away an entire kind of working class culture and way of life in in ten or fifteen years. The left wing version is to, is to be so, is to be careless about mass immigration, um, which also brings with it um, you know gr great disruption and, and 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 you know ends familiarity for people in in certain places. And I think. Um, uh, yes, and I think um, particularly in a secular age when where where meaning is not provided either by a very strict social hierarchy as it would have been in in pre modern times or by religion, um, you know we 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 seek meaning in other ways in in the way, some of the ways that Trevor was just describing, and and if those things are taken away from us and if they're taken away very quickly, uh, it does leave people disoriented and. Um, and, and full of resentment, um, and and some of that resentment has you know spilled out in in you know in in populism, in in Brexit, in Trump, and so on. Um, you know, and and some of that is perfectly legitimate, um, and um, some of it less so. Thank you, David. Yes, you, you're right. And of course, uh, for, for me, the, the the standout moment of the 2016 referendum was that that moment on Question Time when the woman called out from the audience, "That's your bloody GDP, not ours." Um, which it, it, I thought was just a fascinating insight to, you know, obviously GDP is just a national measure, but if you're not personally benefiting from the changes that are happening in, in the wider country, if, if, if there's no sense of uh, agency, it, it, you know, it, it, it leads to alienation. And that, that's the whole other debate. Julie, did I see... Can, can, can I just add, say yes, something yes. very briefly about that, Richard? I think actually um, one of the things that we should have learned from the Brexit vote which um, I think most people are still reluctant to acknowledge, is that uh, that remark about GDP mm. reflected the sense that actually for a lot of people, the things that we, we clever people who make decisions and get have all the airtime, things that we think are 
important and valuable aren't as important and valuable as we think. So we think people need more houses. Actually, it isn't always the case they need, they want another house. What they really want is to have their son and their daughter, when they start their families, to be within walking distance, like their parents were, rather than having to move to Manchester or Leeds. And we think we'll give them a job, even if it's an industrial estate, 20 miles from where their children are at school, when they themselves went to school around the corner and so on and so forth. And people were willing to sacrifice what we regard as material, the 40,000 or whatever it was that we on the remain, I'm a remainer, we on the remainer said, you know, you're gonna lose. And actually what I found was that people say, well, fine, as long as I get to do something else that works with my life, I don't mind not having that in my pay packet. Mm. Mm. So, so basically, what I'm basically saying is, um, it isn't all about money. No, do you know what, Trevor, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and sorry, Julia, would you like to come in at that point? I mean, it absolutely isn't all about money. And I think your reference to Sebastian Payne's book is really interesting, as is David Skelton's book, The Small Battalions, which covers the same territory. And I think it's about how we deal with transition in this country. We mm. do it in this handbrake turn way. So actually, you can map some of the Brexit voting areas and the deindustrialized areas, that huge sweep of the countryside where, frankly, men were left on invalidity benefit rather than anyone making any plans for how a new economy would be formed. And the notion that I think in the United States where if the factory goes, everybody leaves, is not how we've done things here. The fact that the factory goes, people stay, but they stay in pretty powerless state. And I think civil society in its broader sense, including trade unions, have a role to be much more responsible about how we make a transition happen. That deindustrialization was catastrophic. We're going through losing a million jobs in retail, which nobody's talking about because it's not like the steel industry going, because it's women's jobs and it's scattered across the country. But that's a lot of impoverished households very quickly in a very rapid turnaround without, as far as I can see, any discussion about how do people feel they belong if they haven't got work to belong to. And I think the reason I mean, a lot of people I know were Brexiteers, although I wasn't. A lot of people felt that they hadn't had the benefits of modernity and globalisation. And they were right, because actually what they'd had was this rapid, in the way that David describes it, rapid disintegration of a way of life, which was matched by a withering away of those bits of civil society which belonged to those places. Working men's clubs, chapel, churches pubs which were universal and lots of, well for men, lots of men would go to, all disappearing at the same time is a dangerous thing to do to a place and shows a lack of stewardship that I think we are all have some responsibility for. And I'm labouring the point, not because it happened, I've got quite an elderly panel here, not because it happened and we can all remember it, but because it's happening again. And it's happening in different ways now, but we must do something more to plan for that transition. You're, you're absolutely right, Julia. Where, when David was talking about the, 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 the coal mines closing, it reminded me that, you know, every 12 months or so on Twitter, there's a sort of spat between, you know, who closed more mines than the other and, and who provided more support or less support for communities. But the, the fact is the mines were closed. Communities were largely abandoned. And, and we risk repeating that, as you say, with the collapse of retail or the change, let's say, in retail. Yeah. Although, yeah, I mean, to, to stick up for the government, I mean, you might say that the whole levelling up uh, I mean, levelling up is, you know, is the central sort of big idea sort of in post-Brexit politics. And you might say that is a kind of belated apology on the part of the Conservative Party for the, um, you know, for the over-rapid destruction of, of communities. And, I mean, it is simply, it is simply the case that um, nobody in the last 30 or 40 years has, um, you know, has focused uh, consistently on our grotesque regional inequalities, which have been exacerbated by by those industrial shifts, um, and clearly at the moment it's just a phrase. Um, you know, white paper is promised. I think later in the year, um, but I mean, it is surely the right thing to focus on. Um, and you know, the extraordinary differences in longevity uh, in in different parts of the country. Um, you know, th- this is this is what politics should be focusing on and, and I'm you know and we'll, we'll, we 
we'll have to wait and see what they come up with. Thank you, David. And I'll, I'll put a pin in that because that hopefully is what the conversation will be about on the, on the fourth um, uh, event in this series on, on government. Now, I asked for uh, lots of questions and we've, we've duly got lots of questions and, and they're good questions. They're, they're really well aligned with the conversation we've been having. So I'm going to try and pick my way through them. The first is from Jenny Sinclair. It's long and I'll, I'll abbreviate it, but I think we've already answered the first part of it. It says, do the panel accept that civil society has been weakened over the last 40 years as a state of market have become dominant? Well, I'm just going to answer that on your behalf. I think you've all said yes to that in one way or another. Um, you can correct me if, if I have got that wrong. But the second half of the question is more interesting. Can, and it comes to what you were saying, David, about regional inequality and, 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 and perhaps the centralization of this country. Can subsidiarity help us here? What are, and what are the unique responsibilities of a local business, a tenants association, a union, a care home? How can these local institutions constitute building a thicker layer of civil society to push back against the dominance of the market and the state? So uh, can subsidiarity be part of uh, the solution here? Well, if subsidiarity means more power to communities, either of place or of interest, yes, because that's what civil society is always about. It is very rarely at a whole population level. It is about particular concerns and particular issues. But I'm not with you, Richard. I don't think it has been diminished. I think civil society looks different. I think it's been very threatened and some individual organisations have ended up looking far too closely for approval to government or funders or commissioners. But the vast bulk of civil society is in good heart and really interesting things are happening. New organisations are forming all the time. They may not look the same as the ones that were formed some time ago, but actually when you look at what young people are doing and how they're organising in ways that may appall some of us, um, they are still going for change and doing it collectively and trying to use their shared power, which is after all what civil society is about, it's people coming together on an issue and trying to make some connections. And it may feel like a massively my, tiny minority, or it may feel like a very particular issue. I think that's, that's how social change happens. And I think it's in good shape at the moment. Thanks, Julia. And thanks for uh, you know, challenging my, my assertion. I, I don't know if uh, David or Trevor, you, you also want to challenge that. Uh, has the civil society got weaker over the last 40 years? Or is it just different? Yes, well, David. Well, I mean, I think back, back to what we were just talking about, regional inequality, I, mean, I think civil society is a lot stronger in, in more affluent areas. Um, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't know what the evidence on this is, but I mean, to, you know, to, when I, you know, to the extent that I kind of travel around the country, you do get a, a feeling of... Um, of, of a stronger community in, in, in places that have things going for them um, and, and weaker civil society institutions where they don't. And, and of course, you know, what, one of the, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of human capital aspect of this, if you like, um, you know, it is one of the great contradictions of, of public policy. Um, I mean, we're, no, we're straying into the, into the government uh, episode again, I know, but, you know, one of the great contradictions of public policy of the last, um three or four decades i guess has been you know on the one hand people have wrung their hands you know both parties or the, in the political class about the growing regional inequality and on the other hand we've been promoting uh, a, a system through the expansion of higher education which has sucked out you know the brightest and most ambitious and energetic young kids you know from the, the you know from the from working class towns like the mansfields and the rotherhams um, and because of our system of residential universities, they've gone away and they tended not to go back. Um, you know, something like sort of two thirds of all graduates end up in, at least for a period in London. Uh, you know, and our, and, our, and our whole growth model has essentially been, you know, London professional and, and financial services uh, and inward investment and higher education. Um, and that is sort of partly, I think, what the whole, the whole leveling up uh, uh, agenda has got to come up with a kind of new growth uh, strategy that it, that is that is different to that. Um, but I mean, I, you know, it's it's a, it's the very people who who kind of who set up and run um, civil society organisations who have been taken out of of those places that need it that that, that need them most. Julia, I know you want to come back in, but I just I, I did see Trevor looking quizzical when David was saying that. Um, civil society is strongest in the most affluent areas. I thought I did. Um... Well, uh, I, I wasn't really looking quizzical at that because I think actually the, the, the thing I was 
the thing I was raising my eyebrows at is the sort of um, the idea that what what people mean when they talk about civil society is in somehow in some way separate from uh, the uh, players in the market. I mean, actually, certainly in this country, uh, civil society really for certainly probably the last 150 years has only really had institutional meaning uh, because of its relationship and its support by, frankly, by capitalism. I mean, all of those towns I was talking about earlier on, you go and you look at almost every single um, institution of civil society with the possible exception, and I only say possible exception, of, uh, for example, working men's clubs, they will have been built on some relationship with basically the outfit who owned that town. Um, and, you know, with the, Julia sitting here, Roundtree. I mean, Roundtree didn't just pick up a bag of gold. They, you know, they, they, they made, and I think the, the, the essential point really here is I don't, I don't think there is this sort of, you know, there's civil society, which is good, and people's, you know, an expression of people's decency, and there's nasty capitalism, which is about greedy, fat blokes. Um, actually, the, those two things have been more intertwined, actually more intertwined, if I can put it this way, than the state. And my own, this is my personal view, generally speaking, civil society tends to suffer more uh, the more it has a close relationship with the state. Uh, you know, we can have an argument about the issue of voluntary organisations stepping in for local authorities and all that kind of stuff, which is one that I know rumbles on forever. But generally speaking, it's not a happy relationship. I think the real issue for me is that as um, the economy, the way that we create wealth and prosperity is changing, we haven't yet found a proper way of, um, of, of understanding how we create a relationship between that process and the kind of non-commercial choices a community or a neighborhood might want to make and how it might want to organize itself and how the, let's call it the market bit, the commercial bit might support that. Because I can tell you, most people who own businesses are very, very aware of their need to be good citizens uh, and to contribute to the development of neighborhoods and communities and networks, because they know that they can't, you, you can't make money, generally speaking, uh, unless you are connected to, to communities. Thank you, Trevor. You, you remind me to say that of a wonderful anecdote, which clearly can't be true about Henry Ford when he built his first car factory in the UK uh, and the, the town council wanted to open a, wanted Ford, the Ford Motor Company to build a working men's club alongside it. And they refused repeatedly to do it. And then when he was over in the UK to kind of cut the ribbon and, and open the factory, the mayor simply announced that, you know, Henry Ford had very generously agreed to open a working men's club for the benefit of the workers at the factory. Uh, uh, to which Henry Ford said he, he would completely be happy to do that as long as uh, above the entrance to the Working Men's Club there is a quote from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 25, verse 35. Of course, I was a stranger and you took me in. Uh, and yeah. that, that, that very British tradition of, of uh, as you say, capitalism effectively supporting civil society is well made. Julia, I, I, I interrupted with my little pointless anecdote but did you want to a good one it was a good one i think it's the best method of fundraising i've ever used just to thank somebody for money that they have not agreed to give me yet i shall use it <laughs> i mean i was it was me who was looking skeptical about the issue of the um misalignment of where civil society is active because in all the research i've done and my experience is that civil society is at its most active in the areas of real need and that the atomized lifestyle that we read about as a worrying thing of people not knowing their neighbours, not being connected, not having those networks, is much more evident in the gated communities of the leafy suburbs. So there is some research evidence, and I've seen somebody in the Q&A has cited some, but quite a lot of evidence now 
that in places where people have a sense of belonging, which might well be a poorer place, either a place of inward migration or immigration, or a place where people just feel left behind, to use that very tricky term. Um, there is huge solidarity and quite a lot of action and sometimes fueled by anger, but often fueled by care. And I think those are all quite good motivations. Um, I think we have to be very careful though about this. You know, we can romance it. We can talk about communities being completely self-sufficient and they're not. And they absolutely defend, depend in the way that Trevor says on local businesses, on philanthropy, on local government and others with money. But in many parts of the country now, you will find that there is more money going to some of the smaller community organisations than the local authority has. Relationships have changed very dramatically in the last 15 years. And that because of lottery funding in Halifax, supporting the Peace Hall, which is this fantastic heritage initiative there that has mobilised and changed and transformed a part of West Yorkshire, there is money in some places where you wouldn't have expected to see it. So I think we have to not be backward looking on this. I think there is movement which looks very different in different parts of the country. Thank you, Julia. I, I want to move on to uh, another question, this one from, from Rita Chadda, and I'd probably direct it to you in the first instance, Julia. She says, is part of the challenge the fact that the term civil society is too broad? Universities, charities, unregistered community groups, faith groups, all governed by different rules and have different cultures of would narrowing down the definition of civil society help create a more positive space for discussing the common good? As, as the chair of Civil Society Futures, it seemed a good uh, place to start. Well, it was the name I was given by the people who decided to fund it. And I have to say, at one point in the very early meeting, someone said, oh, but do we really want to call it civil society? I had to threaten to jump out of the window because in a way, once we open that discussion, we go nowhere. We are so good at policing boundaries and worries about definition. And... You know, it's, it's not adequate to talk about a whole sector as um, neither state or market. It's sort of nonsensical. And as we've all said today, there is bleeding at the edges of all of that. And there are bits of what used to be done by the state that have now moved out wholesale into the voluntary sector. The companies which, as Trevor was saying, know perfectly well that they need a license to operate. And that involves working with communities. There's all sorts of mixing going on. But I think there is something rather powerful about organisations whose impulse is neither to make profit, although they need to make a return and they need to carry on bringing money in, or democratic legitimacy. I think those are two different impulses. And actually, even our big household name charities, you trace Oxfam back to a group of people concerned about Greek refugees in the late 40s, sitting around a kitchen table in Oxford. There is something very valuable about that impulse, which comes from people wanting to make a difference about something that other people may not give a damn about, but actually they want to make a difference. So that's why I've gone for the broadest possible definition, but it's hellishly difficult. And Rita, I agree with you. I often think it gets in the way, but I think we're so good at definitional discussions. I think we've got a bigger, more, more challenging agenda ahead of us. So I'm sort of counselling. Let's not open that one just yet. Thanks, Julia. I'm going to turn to one last question. David, I, I, I was going to ask you the question, but so you feel free to join it up. Uh, add to Judah's answer in a second. This is just from an anonymous attendee, and I, I wanted to raise it with you because you both raised the international dimension in the discussion and also the role of healthcare. And this question is, in some countries, Germany, for example, there's a huge role for civil society, especially churches, in providing healthcare. Um, it says in brackets, just as there is in the UK when it comes to hospices, or for that matter, schooling. The, the questioner would be interested in views about whether we should move away from our uniquely centralised model in the UK when it comes to the provision of healthcare. So, David, I don't know if you had a, a view on that, but as a piece, feel free to add to anything Julia said in, in response to the previous question as well. Yeah, and I, I was just, I mean, I, I agree with this point about language. I mean, civil society is sort of is so broad, isn't it? I mean, if, if, it's, if it's everything that isn't the private realm or the state, and formal politics then then it is it's you know it's 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 impossible to get hold of really and, and subdividing it i think would be helpful in a discussion like this um i know but it did also make me think of um, the, the one kind of organization we haven't actually mentioned so far um that carries the you know the kind of the hopes and disappointments of so many millions of people is of course football clubs um you know which are you know great sort of crucibles of lo feelings of local attachment. Um, and also, you know, to, uh, you know, as Trevor was suggesting, they are also invariably, anyway, capitalist organisations, albeit not very profitable ones. 
Um, but um, yeah, it's an interesting point about Germany. Um, Germany is a somewhat more traditional society than ours. It is a somewhat more religious one, um, perhaps partly because it's it's about 50% Catholic. Um, and yes, uh, and it has a much more sort of pluralistic health system. I mean, they have compulsory health insurance, but the providers of, of health care are much more varied uh, than is the case here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Um, I think the, the, the German model in that respect, um, I, I mean, I think it'd be quite difficult for us to, I mean, it, it's, not, um, it's not impossible to imagine um, um, care homes being um, taken over by, I mean, you know, and actually this, perhaps, perhaps this is the way to save the Anglican church from complete oblivion. Um, it, you know, it has all this, it's apparently just spent 240 million pounds trying to attract people back into church. Well, perhaps it should invest in um, in running care homes and it could become a kind of model for, for the social care sector. What a brilliant idea. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. I'm, I'm conscious of the time um, and uh, we've, we've, we haven't really barely scratched the surface of some of these excellent questions. So I'm, I'm sorry to the questioners that we're not going to be able to get to all of your questions. I'm very keen to, to give all of our panellists a sort of final one or two minutes just to, to summarise uh, their views of, of the conversation and what they've taken from this and what they think we uh, should take from it. Uh, and Trevor, I was going to invite you to perhaps go first with that, if that's right. Oh, right. OK, so, uh, so I haven't quite realised we got to that point. OK. Um, I think I'll just make one point, really, um, about the about the basic premise of our discussion. Um, I still think, I mean, I do think myself that there is something called the common good. What I don't think is that, um, let me put it this way. I think there is a comfortable fiction that uh, people, certainly in the circles that I move in, uh, there's a comfortable fiction, comfortable fiction that people tell themselves, which is that if sensible people of goodwill get together and they talk to each other enough and they are, you know, in the general sense of the word, civil to each other and they think about it and they share ideas, that they will eventually reach agreement and it'll all be lovely. I just don't think that's true. It is just not true. What it usually means, actually, is that um, people get together and there's a sort of majoritarian pressure that squeezes out uh, the unorthodox, that suppresses the voice of minorities, and that disguises the true um, divisions in our society, many of which are not divisions between stupid people and clever people or good people and bad people. They are between people who have different experiences and different ambitions for their lives. Uh, so it, the first thing I would say um, that I would like everybody who's engaged in civil society to do, which I think it has stopped what we generally think about as civil society, quote unquote, third sector, is it needs to get back to being honest. It needs to stop telling itself that there's good people who believe what the, the folks in this particular room think. Um, it could provide a, an incredibly valuable service in our current time of disruption and uncertainty to provide a place in which people can be genuinely honest and open about things they don't know, about the things that they will, the, 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 the lines that they will not cross, uh, the things that they will not concede. At the very least, uh, civil society can allow us to be transparent with each other without cost. And I think that would be a huge, huge service to society as a whole. Um, and I think the other point I would really uh, just make is, um, you know, somebody, a uh, chair, charities, I sit on boards, I give money and so on. 
I just wish civil society, as we currently construct it, could stop being as self-righteous as it is about itself. I really do. Thank you, Trevor. Julia, can I invite you to give some closing comments? I could gladly agree about that. I think the self-righteousness is a sin crying out to heaven. I know we have to be really careful about it. I think civil society at its best represents very different interests and very different worldviews. And there is no point in pretending that difficult decisions don't at some stage have to be made. I completely agree with Trevor. There is a sort of fiction that if we all just sit around and civilise for long enough, we will think our differences. Actually, sometimes we won't. And you carry on needing to have representation on particular issues. But if you think of our largely impersonal state and how far it sometimes feels from people's needs, I really value the voices of people which may be discordant, may be very different from each other, but us are arguing for during the pandemic, do remember the people with a particular sort of blood cancer who have been shielding indefinitely. Those voices of unorthodox, maybe minority concerns are incredibly valuable. In the end, yes, politicians will make decisions. Civil servants will give them recommendations. But if we lose those voices, I think we are losing any contact with the different experiences. And we then do run, run the risk of a sort of majoritarian view that most people think. And I think that's really dangerous. The second thing I think is if we don't foster the sort of civil society I've talked about, and I think there are ways of undermining it, which we frequently do, but there are ways of fostering it too. We undermine still further that hugely important need to belong. And we do know that that need to belong is a real and human one. And if we don't have a multiplicity of places, and youth theatres and arts groups, whatever it happens to be in that locality, people will want to belong somewhere else. And there are people out there very able, very skillfully able to manipulate pretty dark places. So I think that's the second reason it matters. It's part of a healthy society is that you can express your views, however odd they are, by mixing with others. Um, and finally, I think we face an extraordinary precarious time and we've come through a global pandemic, which as I said earlier on, I don't think we've yet calibrated how much damage it's done. We seem to be about to go into an extraordinary winter where things are going to be massively disrupted. We face economic volatility. We almost certainly face further terrorism, climate issues and cyber attacks. We need the strength and resilience that good, strong, well-connected civil society can bring. And I think it's not, doesn't on its own deliver the common good, but nobody can deliver the common good without civil society's active engagement. Thank you, Julia. Uh, a wonderful point. David, over to you. Yeah, um, well, um, uh, it's been very, it's been a, a useful conversation for me uh, and um, uh, I um, admire Trevor's bracing realism on this subject. Um, that yeah. isn't what you usually call it. <laughs> um, and, you know, he, he is quite right. I mean, that, uh, you know, of, of course, we, you know, we, we want to, you know, we don't want to completely reject the idea of the common good, but we have to be realistic about the fact that, you know, you, you, you know, you know, modern liberal democracies, rich liberal democracies are very complicated places full of, um, uh, insoluble conflicts of interests between between individuals and groups and um, and handling um, those conflicts in the most sort of open-hearted way, uh, the most generous way, um, you know, is is a it's a kind of social aptitude that um, I mean, uh, as Julia was just saying, that we have we're in danger of losing you know as as we we actually mix less than we used to the, the conformism that is driven by social media the kind of the social media bubble cliche is is unfortunately a true one um and i think it's it has contributed to the to what we've seen happening to 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 kind of progressive thought particularly in 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 the last decade or two, the way in which the sort of, you know, the, the great river of progress and basic sort of decency uh, has, uh, you know, has uh, at least in part kind of curdled into, into something um, much harder and more intolerant um, and uh, al almost cult-like. 
Um, and I think um, we, you know, that and uh, amongst other things, we, we, we can only contest with, um, with a much more, with, with a different attitude to managing conflict, uh, a more generous attitude to managing conflict, um, and um, my, and uh, Julia, um, I, I'm, I, I hope you're right, and, and I'm sure you do know far more about this than me. Um, I mean, the, the other the other thing that I've learned is that my assumption about um, well, certain kinds of civil society organisations not necessarily um, being stronger in. Not necessarily, I mean, I wasn't really suggesting in, in sort of rich areas, in gated communities, but in kind of middling sort of areas, I've assumed a kind of, you know, almost by definition more resilient and part of the expression of that resilience is that they tend to have better connections between people and those are expressed partly institutionally. Um, but if it's true that actually um, struggling places um, do better, I mean, I, I mean, that... Um, that is that is that is good news, <laughs> um, and um, I will um, I will I will revise my view. <laughs> um, and you said that somebody had left some some evidence for that in the in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll look that up. Will we be able to look at things after after? Yes, after yes. Um, yeah. As I said, the, the, the whole recording will be available, and the, and the chat will also be available for, will, for as well. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, we, we've all just got to mix mix more across all of our boundaries of uh, class and ethnicity and geography. And um, um, I don't think there was a golden age of this either. I mean, we all we we um, we used to be uh, we used to mix more in some ways, but less in other ways. I think if you um, if you go back in time, um, but yeah, I, th I think that's that is. For, you know, that is the way in which we, in which civil society flourishes best when we when we cross those boundaries as much as possible, and in doing so, learn how to disagree well with people on the other side of those boundaries. David, thank you very much, and, and thank you also, Julia and Trevor, for such a powerful conversation. Thank you also to the audience. There's been an incredibly powerful conversation going on in the chat, and as I say, we we can record that with Zoom, and so we we will do so. Um, it's been, a, it's been a wonderful evening. I've really, really enjoyed it. And, and, and so thank you to you all. Before we go, just a quick reminder about the fourth and final event in the series, The Common Good and Government. It'll be held on Tuesday, the 16th of November. You can find full details on the Together for the Common Good website and on the St. Mary's website. And we have another great set of speakers lined up for you. Danny Kruger, MP, Parliamentary Private Secretary to Michael Gove, at the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Lord Morris Glassman, political theorist, social commentator and Labour life peer. And Caroline Slowcock, former civil servant and the first female private secretary at number 10, working with both Margaret Thatcher and John Major. And the event will be chaired by Ruth Kelly, the former Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government and now Pro Vice Chancellor at St Mary's University. And unlike the first three events, this one will be in person at the Church of St. Mary's Putney in London, home of the historic 1647 Putney debates. Places will be limited and booking will be open nearer the time. We really hope you can join us. And if not in person, then do watch online and please tell your friends and colleagues about it. As I said earlier, a recording of tonight's event will be on our website shortly. And if you haven't already seen them, do go and watch the first and second events in the series. The common good, what does it mean? And the common good, what does it mean for families? And so finally, on behalf of our partners, thank you to our speakers, to David, Trevor, Julia and Tim, to our sponsor, CCLA, and especially to all of you for your participation this evening. Goodbye and see you next time.